when Jesus had paid the price for our sins and he was resurrected and was about to leave, he had left behind a most wonderful assurance to his followers. And there in John 14, verses 1 to 3, is that assurance that he had given before, but now, as he was on his way, the apostles could remember. Verses 1 to 3 of John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Do you believe those words? During the past year of divine services that I have delivered here, 26 times, we had looked into the depth of the preparations that we need to enter into here on earth to fit us for a place in that heavenly kingdom. And Jesus said, I want you to be there. Let not your heart be troubled. Why did we have to go through thus the, such careful research in preparation? Why? Why could we not just be rejoicing in the fact that Jesus wants us to be there and be done with it? It's because of Steps to Christ. We read there on page 17, paragraph 2. In Steps to Christ, page 17, paragraph 2, where it says, After sin, man could no longer find joy in holiness, and he sought to hide from the presence of God. The condition of the unrenewed heart is still like that. It is not in harmony with God and finds no joy and communion with Him. The sinner could not be happy in God's presence. He would shrink from the companionship of holy beings. Could he be permitted to enter heaven, it would have no joy for him. Why? The spirit of unselfish love that reigns there, every heart responding to the heart of infinite love, would touch no answering chord in his soul. His thoughts, his interests, his motives would be alien to those that actuate the sinless dwellers there. 
he would be a discordant note in the melody of heaven. Heaven would be to him a place of torture. He would long to be hidden from him who is its light and the center of its joy. It is no arbitrary decree on the part of God that excludes the wicked from heaven. They are shut out by their own unfitness for its companionship. The glory of God would be to them a consuming fire. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. According to what we are reading here, with our natural condition here on earth, we need to become fitted to enjoy heaven. Because our, we, as we were passing through all the different preparatory messages, we considered closely certain aspects there which we really have to make changes in our life to, to meet up with the mentality that the society of heaven is governed by. We looked at these points very carefully. The compassion towards a sinner that actuates heaven. And we saw how when we relate to sinners around us, we go, um, <laughs> we don't want to be in their presence. But the angels were prepared. And Jesus became a, a, a partner with us. Heaven's mentality was to come close to the sinner. The unlovely. We saw that true Sabbath keeping needed to be embraced in our life so that the eternal Sabbath rest and the Sabbath of week after week in the, in the heavenly realm will be, not be marred by us. We studied carefully the nature of the final crisis that will take place just before Jesus comes. How if we are not in tune with his ways, we will be contributive to the crisis. We saw that music that is in heaven is not the natural music in our experience. It's a different music, a different harmony. We needed to prepare for that. We needed to follow Jesus perfectly in our research that we might be with him in the heavenly realm. We saw that the imminent close of probation was of such a troubling uh, effect that it would be actually, if we are not prepared for it and it closes, we would be shut out. We saw that we needed to diligently study the Bible. We saw how our stewardship needed to be carefully looked at to prepare for that place. We saw that heaven must actually exist in my soul. It must exist in my family. It must exist in the church if we are going to have a place there. We saw that male and female proprieties needed to be taken into consideration in preparation for heaven. And we saw that there must be no rifts in the church or in the family. No rifts at all. We are to have a perfect family setting to be ready to enter heaven. A perfect church family setting. And we saw that we need to submit ourselves to those who are rulers over us here on earth to be able to cope with having rulers over us there in the heavenly, in the heavenly realm. Because everyone has different positions. 
we saw that we need to be truly contrite if we are going to sit in His throne. We saw that we must have true peace in our soul. That we must have true patience. And that the fasting of the health reform was part of our preparation. And as we went through every successive meditation, after all that, and taking a good honest look at ourselves, at our home, and at the church experiences that we are making, how did you feel? Is there any appearance of ever getting there? Especially when Matthew chapter 5 verse 48 says that we should be perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect. Let's read it there. Very simply put, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in, which is in heaven is perfect. And we highlighted 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Let's read it again. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Be ye therefore pure, perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. As you take this in, do you become overwhelmed with a sense of anxiousness? Oh Lord, help me. I'm not displaying these things yet. And all through my life and your life, as we are heading closer and closer to the coming of Jesus, do we sense that we are making it? I must address this as I come to the close of our series. We must address ourselves to this anxiety. And I, want, I have been strongly stimulated to share this message with you this morning because while I was away, I was invited to listen to a sermon that was preached in the Adventist church at Warunga in Sydney, where I used to attend. And a minister was preaching there in reference to righteousness by faith. And he told a story of his own experience with a friend of his when he was a youth that he met in New Zealand as he was there with his father's ministry and he was sharing this heartbreaking story how his friend that he <coughs> had been associating with closely finally as he got older began to deteriorate while he himself was progressing in his experience with the Lord and this friend of his became a to cut the long story short he began, became a drug addict and really became belligerent in reference to what Adventism was meant to be. He lost his way. And then this minister told how he heard that his friend had come to the message of the 1888 presentations of the independent Seventh-day Adventists there. And how this young man 
gave his heart to the Lord, turned away from the entire ways of his past, completely changed. And as this man was preaching there, he walked on one side of the pulpit and said, first he was there and now he was on the other side, extremely uh, devoted to perfectionism. And after a period of time, he left a message to his mother. Mother, I have been trying to reach the standard that we have been taught and I can't make it. And he went and committed suicide in a most horrific way as it was described there. I don't want to describe it here. And as a consequence of this story, this minister taught the way of salvation, of righteousness by faith, by saying there is nothing that we can do to reach that perfection. And this message of 1888 is a false message because it brings people to such a condition that they will finally feel that it's hopeless. I will never get there. And I want to address this important subject now because how is it with you and me in the secret crevices of our soul? Do you sometimes, as you have moved along with the advancing message, and it gets more and more pristine in its, in its richness of expectation, of perfection. And the more you follow this message, the more it takes you down the drain inside of yourself. I'm just not going to achieve it. I can't reach this perfection. And that there is maybe a thought under there that makes you think, I, I've got no hope. And their temptation to do what this man did has come across your mind? And if it hasn't come, Satan will make sure that it will come. Believe it. Follow carefully what the Spirit of the Lord is going to show us now to eradicate that temptation. So, do you believe John 14, verse 2 and 3? That Jesus said, I want you to be where I am. Do you believe that? You need to. And you'll see as we proceed. This scripture, I go and prepare a place for you. Let not your heart be Troubled. Why did he say, let not your heart be troubled? Because he knew that as we travel along and we are in need of reaching that high position, that high calling, we will be troubled. But he said, I go and prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. What do these words suggest? What do they suggest to you? Something like John 17, 24? Let's read it there. John 17, 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. 
What is Jesus' cry? What is he yearning for? He says, Father, I want them to be with me. I go and prepare a place for you. Don't let your heart be troubled. I want you to be with me. Can you pick up the yearning of God, the Father and the Son, for you and me to be with Him? What is God's preoccupation for the sinful world that we're in and for us? What is His preoccupation? Consider it in Second Peter 3 verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us would, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is God's preoccupation? He is waiting because He wants no one to be lost. His heart of love and compassion is ready to suffer long because He did not want anyone to perish. And then those beautiful words of John 3.16, so easily rattled off and not thought deeply about. For God so loved the world. How, who did he love? The world. The whole human race. Every single one of the wickedness of them. He loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what is he yearning for? He wants everybody to believe and to accept Jesus Christ, so that they would not perish. And this is something to meditate about. As we think of this sad story of this young man who had given up his drug world because he was attracted to this beautiful message and then was overwhelmed with the deep sense of his unworthiness that he's never going to get there because perfection is required in his life. That's what is being taught in the true 1888 message. Perfection in the life. And he, reaching for that perfection in his life, came to the conclusion, this is impossible. I've learned all about it through the 1888 message, but I can't see it happening. It's not possible. He took his life. Then, what did he miss out on in this beautiful message? We read it here in Steps to Christ. Page 13. And I wonder whether we've got these beautiful messages streaming past us and we miss them. He must have missed something. And I'd like you to consider very, very carefully what you and I may be missing in this beautiful message. It says here on paragraph 2 on page 13, it says, but this great sacrifice was not made in order to create in the Father's heart a love for man. Not to make him willing to save. No, no. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The Father loves us not because of the great propitiation, but he provided the propitiation because he loves us. 
Because we use the word propitiation as a gift. That's trans- the wording means a gift to produce a, a, a love. But he didn't give that propitiation to produce love in him. No. He provided it because he loves us. Christ was the medium through which he could pour out his infinite love upon a fallen world. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God suffered with his Son in the agony of Gethsemane, the death of Calvary, the heart of infinite love paid the price of our redemption. Jesus said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. That is, my Father has so loved you, that he even loves me more, for giving my life to redeem you. In becoming your substitute and surety by surrendering my life, by taking your liabilities, your transgressions, I am endeared to my Father for my sacrifice. By my sacrifice, God can be just and yet the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. Can you just about see God going... I'm so glad that my son has prepared to give himself because I wanted to justify all these people and I looked for some sort of way out and, oh, my son, my wonderful son, he's prepared to do it for these people. I love him all the more. Can you see what God is like? He's bending over backwards to try and make us Citizens in his beautiful kingdom. Let's read it in Romans 5. Romans 5, verses 6 to 10. Here is the description of this amazing love. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. The ungodly. Who did he die for? The ungodly. He loved them so much that he died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God is looking upon this decrepit human sinners. And he says, oh, how can I absolutely deal with them to redeem them? And and, and he said, oh, my lovely son, he's prepared to come and do this. I love him so that he can die while they're yet sinners. But now that being the case, verse 9, much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Much more. So what he did while we were in hopeless depravity... We are justified. Every hopeless case is justified already. There is not a sinner in this world who is not justified 
But the question is, will the sinner really trust this wonderful love? And if we do, then much more, having been reconciled by while we be yet enemies, how much more shall we be saved by his life? Let it percolate into this dense head of ours, into the heart. Because I'm saying this because while these beautiful messages are streaming from God, people will do what this man did. And even though this young man took his life, others don't take their life. They just go mulling along in the dry salt lakes of this world. Not rejoicing in the pure comfort that Jesus and the Father in heaven have actually bound themselves to save us. With such a heart of love, can you despair? Such a heart of love to you and me. Isn't that what we were just singing before? Um, Jesus, I my cross have taken. It, it sang there. Um, it says, uh, let me see whether I can... Yes. So then know thy full salvation. Rise or sin and fear and care. Rise above all that. Because of this full salvation. It says, think, think what spirit dwells within thee. Think what Father's smiles are thine. Think that Jesus died to win thee. Child of heaven, canst thou repine? But I'm such a sinner. That's all right. How can you repine? with the sense of your failures, when you see God is so absolutely bent on saving you. While you were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, God gave himself in his Son. Well, what can he do now that we have been justified? Much more he will save us. How can I repine? And as it was with Abraham, so it must be with us. It's written there beautifully in Romans 4, verses 18 to 25. Because Abraham was given a promise. And that promise looked pretty impossible to take place. What has God promised? He has promised to save us. He has promised to take us to heaven. He's preparing a place for us there. Can we take hold of that without repining because we think we're not going to make it? Romans 4, 18 to 25. Here it is. Who against hope? What? Abraham, against hope, believed in hope. Now that's a very important st statement. He had no hope. But he believed in hope. God had promised him something. Let's read on. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not. Now can you see these words? Hope against hope. It's not staggering. This poor young man staggered. How many times do you stagger 
at the thought of the high expectations in your life. And you look at it and you go, <coughs> that's staggering. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. What's the first angel's message? Fear God and give glory to Him. Be like Abraham, being fully persuaded that what He had promised, He was able also to perform. Tell me, if you stagger and you think you're not going to make it and you harbor that thought, are you believing God? Do you doubt that he is able to perform what he has promised? And Abraham did not doubt that, even though he went through the test and he wanted to help God and it ended up in a mess. But God's way still went ahead. And remember that. You may want to help and you may come short of it and it's a big mess. Don't despair. How many times have you made a mess in thinking that I'm going to get there and I'm going to work for it and then you come crashing down again and again until finally it, it dawns upon you. <laughs> I've, I've been doing this trying to help God. It's very close work, isn't it? Co-partnership with God, helping God. Uh, mm, which way is it meant to be? Yes, we are to be co-partners with him. We are to do our part as we studied in the Sabbath school lesson and we'll keep on going on that even now. But Abraham wanted to help God and it became a mess. It was not until he trusted implicitly that God would do that work and then it happened. So it says in verse 22, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness, because he trusted God. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised up again for our justification. That wonderful act of love. Do you believe it? Do you? Believe it when everything looks hopeless. Believe it. Because what God has promised, He is able to perform. And so, as it says, being not weak in faith. And here is what I'd like you to meditate about now. Not weak in faith. Now what is the faith which operates in developing righteousness? Because it's righteousness by faith. Hmm. What is that? Let's read it here in Steps to Christ, page 63, paragraph 2. Steps to Christ, page 63, paragraph 2. When we speak of faith, there is a distinction that should be born in mind. Now follow carefully. Which one do you have in your mind? There is a kind of belief that is wholly distinct from faith. The existence and power of God, the truth of His Word, are facts that even Satan and his hosts can at heart, cannot at heart deny. 
The Bible says that the devils also believe and tremble. Does that collate with the text that says those that tremble at his word? Hmm? <laughs> you see, there are some things in the Bible that is a bit hazy to us unless the Holy Spirit really shows us. So they also believe and tremble. But this is not faith. Where there is not only a belief in God's word, but a submission of the will to him. But it doesn't stop there. Where there is a submission of the will to him, where the heart is yielded to him. The heart. The affections fixed upon him. There is faith. The faith that works by love and purifies the soul. What is this faith? A submission of my will to everything that God shows me. Even if it cuts right across my past life and my sense of practical security of what I have regarded as right in my life. God says, no, I want you to lay that off. I've enjoyed it all my life, but it's not what God wants me to do. And I can't see anything wrong with it. Sorry. If you have faith, you will submit yourself to his will. And not only that, your heart is yielded to him in every respect. Whatever you say, Lord, that's it. But not only that, where the affections are fixed upon him. That is where faith is. And that is the faith that leads to righteousness. Righteousness by faith. Faith where the affections are totally wrapped up with my God. And, I, and they continue there. They are fixed upon him. That as soon as there is a temptation of the sinful nature and of Satan working to destroy something my affections in him are so great that uh -uh, no I'm going to sacrifice here this is not this is going to lead me to reach the pure condition of heaven it says through this faith the heart is renewed in the image of God and the heart that is in its unrenewed state, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, now delights in his holy precepts, exclaiming with the psalmist, Oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. And the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. An experience, brethren and sisters, of affections as we see the amazing love of God it begins to work on my heart when I study him I see that the more I see of him the more my heart goes out to him and I keep my heart's affections fixed upon him so that whatever he says that's it Lord thank you and the joy of the hope that starts burning within me causes me to obey every small detail of his will. So by the exercise of such a heart reality, there are two dimensions of salvation that we are to secure. Two dimensions of salvation. Many people only want to hold on to the one. That is what I shared, that God will justify us. 
because he loves us. And many Christians want to stop there. We are saved by faith. And you hear them say, I'm saved. They've only done one dimension of that. Let me read it in detail because it leads us to the two dimensions. It's in Steps to Christ again, page 62. In paragraph 1 to 3 it says, The condition of eternal life, that's what we've been studying. We have studied how to reach a fitness, a condition to live in the society of heaven. The condition of eternal life is just what it always has been. Just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents. What is it? Perfect obedience to the law of God. Perfect righteousness. That's the condition. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. The way would be open for sin with all its train of woe and misery to be immortalized. It was possible for Adam before the fall to form a righteous character by obedience to God's law. But he failed to do this. And because of his sin, our natures are fallen and we cannot make ourselves righteous. Since we are sinful, unholy, we cannot perfectly obey the holy law. Here's the first section of salvation. Follow carefully. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. And now... He offers to take our sins and give us His righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? Now, what is that? If you give yourself to Him and accept Him as your Savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for His sake you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character and you are accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. Are you fit for heaven? Yes, you are. If you were to die today after you have opened your heart to this wonderful truth, are you fit for heaven? Absolutely. But most people stop there. Most preachers stop there. The second section is the next paragraph. It says, more than this. Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith. What was it? Your affections are upon it. Your willing submission, your yielding is maintained. And the continual surrender of your will to Him. And so long as you do this, so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his pleasure. So you may say, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
So Jesus said to his disciples, It is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Then, with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same Spirit and do the same good works, works of righteousness and obedience. You see, what we behold here is that there is our cooperation involved. And the first cooperation is to believe what Jesus has done. Believe those words. And as you believe, you will be justified. And your past sins that you have confessed and cast upon the, the altar are gone. And Jesus now has replaced your past with his perfect righteousness. That is what's called justification. But is that all there is to the story? Definitely not. Because this work of keeping your affections fixed upon him is going to make the change in your practical living. And that is what is termed sanctification. And that can never be gained unless we do what? That you are to maintain a connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, he will prepare you because he wants you to be there. Do you believe this? Is this your preoccupation? That's the question. If it is, then we read Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Luke chapter 12. Verse 32. It says, Fear not, little flock. Isn't that a beautiful word? Fear not, little flock. All the fears that you have, you're not going to make it. Is that a fear? Oh yeah, it gets me by the throat when I permit myself to look at me. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God's pleasure is to give us the kingdom. That thought, if I believe this, and I'm preoccupied with it, I am assured that God is going to get me there. With God's preoccupation and your determination to keep your connection with your personal Savior, Him and you in the atonement, if you will keep your affections fixed upon Him, if you will continue to make this continual surrender, if you're preoccupied with that, doing your part, God will do His part. And what doubts can engage your mind if you're doing that? Doubts? I love the chapter on what to do with doubt in Steps to Christ. And I want to read, first of all, page 54. There, Faith and Acceptance, the chapter, and it says in paragraph 2 there, With the rich promise, with the rich promise of the Bible before you, can you give place to doubt? Can you believe when the poor sinner longs to return, longs to forsake his sins, the Lord sternly withholds him from coming to his feet in repentance? Away with such thoughts. 
Nothing can hurt your own soul more than to entertain such a conception of your heavenly Father. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And he gave himself in the person of Christ that all who would, who would might be saved and have eternal blessedness in the kingdom of God. Eternal blessedness. That's what he wants. What stronger or more tender language could have been employed than he has chosen in which to express his love toward us? He declares, can a woman forsake her suckling child? That she should not have compassion on the son of a womb? Yes, they might forget. Yet will I not forget thee. Do you believe it, brethren and sisters? I minister among lots of you and lots of people across Australia. And I know there are still struggles. I hear it. I get messages of this nature. And I am terribly sad that this is still verbalized among us. Why do I fear that? It's because I don't want anybody to do what this young man did. We have such beautiful comfort here. Why would we doubt if this is what God is preoccupied with for my salvation? And all he wants me to do is to be preoccupied with him. So, look up, you that are doubting and trembling, for Jesus lives to make intercession for us. Thank God for the gift of his dear Son. And pray that he may not have died for you in vain. The Spirit invites you today. Come with your whole heart to Jesus and you may claim his blessing. And then I continue in page 64 of Steps to Christ. There in paragraph 1 onwards, it says, There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ. You've loved, you've loved it, haven't you? I love the way that many of you that I have labored for have come to this beautiful message of Christ's righteousness. And I have baptized and have been influential for your baptism in, in your joy of what you have experienced in the Lord. You've experienced it. You've testified of it. You've rejoiced in it. You've smiled under it. Your heart was rejoicing under it. And you, who have known the pardoning love of Christ, who really desire to be children of God, yet they realize that their character is imperfect and their life faulty, and they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. That's what I hear. And not only do I hear it, I see it. That people go, Mew. and their faces are long. And they come to church with long faces. When they should be smiling and rejoicing to meet each other in the love of the Lord. When you have a wrinkled forehead, you are not trusting When you come along with your burdens to church, you are carrying a heavy load and you are spreading the, 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 the stink of that. And it affects others. We have no reason for sour-facedness at all. It says here, to such who have experienced the joy, who have now lost the joy, to such I would say, do not draw back in despair. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus, not in front of the church, at the feet of Jesus, because of our shortcomings and mistakes. But we are not to be discouraged. 
even if we are overcome by the enemy, we are not to cast off, sorry, we are not cast off, nor forsaken and rejected of God. No, Christ is at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Said the beloved John, These things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Keep on going. And don't forget the words of Christ. The Father himself loveth you. Do you believe it? He desires to restore you to himself, to see his own purity and holiness reflected in you. He wants that. And if you will but yield yourself to him, he that hath begun a good work in you will carry it forward to the day of Jesus Christ. Pray more fervently. Believe more fully. As we come to distrust our own power, let us trust the power of our Redeemer. And we shall praise him who is the health of our countenance. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. Yes, for your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. This is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power, that the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. Rejoice! Instead of saying, oh, I'm such a wretch. Weep at the feet of Jesus, yes. But thank God that he is actually helping you to see it. Rejoice. No deep-seated love for Jesus can dwell in the heart that does not realize his own sinfulness. If you have a deep-seated love for Jesus, you will realize your own sinfulness. The soul that is transformed by the grace of Christ will admire his divine character, but if we do not see our own moral deformity, it is unmistakable evidence that we have not had a view of the beauty and excellence of Christ. So if you see him so vividly, if you see him so wonderful, and you see yourself so absolutely horrible in, in, in contrast, rejoice that you've seen it. And rejoice to come to him in total trust that he will finish the work. And indeed, the less we see to esteem in ourselves, the more we shall see to esteem in the infinite purity and loveliness of our Savior. Do you look for something to esteem inside of you? Oh, yes, you do. I've heard you say it. I've heard you say it. You don't notice that you said it. But I've heard you say, I'm good at this, and I'm not so bad at that, and I'm, I can do this. You are esteeming something in yourself. That's what you are doing. And when you don't see it, you think, I'm useless. I can't do anything right. And you go around moping around on the floor because nobody appreciates your good gifts. Do you do that? I've seen you do it. The less we esteem in ourselves, the more we shall see to esteem in the infinite purity and loveliness of our Saviour. A view of our sinfulness drives us to him who can pardon, and when the soul realizes its helplessness, reaches out after Christ, he will reveal himself in power. The more our sense of need drives us to him and the word of God, the more exalted views we shall have of his character, and the more fully we shall reflect his image unconsciously unconsciously that's what's written I will not be conscious that I am showing all these beautiful characteristics all that I can feel is my decrepitude I'm decrepit 
I can't do anything, but I'm relying on the Lord and I rejoice in His wonderful love. Isn't He beautiful? Isn't He a wonderful God? And when we come to church together, we will not be thinking what this person thinks or that person says or the other person says. We will be rejoicing to be able to share with each other the joys of what the Lord Jesus is doing with us. And that will preoccupy us and we will see Christ in one another because we are preoccupied with Him. Righteousness by faith. So simple, yet so elusive to our sin-polluted attitudes. Don't occupy your mind. Don't occupy your mind with its theory. Don't occupy your mind with the theory of righteousness by faith. Occupy your mind with Jesus. Just open your heart to the Father's love and permit Him to possess your soul. You know, I nearly fell into this trap because I'm a preacher. And where there are so many errors being taught, I want, to, I want to clear the error by upholding the pure theory of righteousness by faith. And you know, by doing that, I nearly lost my focus on Jesus. Because you can become very proud that you've got the subject right. And you might have it right but you haven't got it in life. It is not the problem of the church members to claim that we've got it right. Only the watchmen in the house of Israel have that responsibility. Or that you've got to concentrate on. That I've got to concentrate on while I have to get it right is that I get it right because I'm in love and my affections are centered in God. And that is our occupation, brethren and sisters. And when, we, when he exercises the measures of his purification, then we receive it with gratitude. And this is what I want to conclude next Sabbath. When he exercises his measures of purification, that we receive them with gratitude. May God help us to study and re-go over the, all that we have done in preparation for the coming of Jesus and reflect it all in the eyes of of this message that I have shared with you now. It is the righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ to redeem me from my sinful self by replacing my sinful self with his righteousness. And then, with my heart rejoicing in that, I will continue to submit to his guidance and let him purify my life. And unconscious to myself, that will happen. May God help us, is my prayer. Amen.